thank you, uh, the organizers, for inviting me to this nice workshop. I think it's going really nice. Thanks. Um, also, while well, I'm uh, the PhD student of Professor Thomas Fredriksen at the Thomas International Physics Center. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, electron spin states in graphene nanostructures and how we can study them with the MIMPI Hubbard model. So this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to give a brief introduction of how magnetism can be induced in graphene nanostructures and how we can study it uh, with the MIMPI Hubbard model. Then I will explain a little bit uh, how one can use our implementation of the MIMPI Hubbard model to find a self-consistent solutions uh, for different systems depending on the boundary condition. Um, then I will show an example of uh, some spin transport calculations for multi-terminal devices that we did in the past. And then I will conclude with some final remarks. Okay, so first of all, graphene is not in principle a uh, magnetic material. Uh, however, there are several ways in which we can induce magnetism in graphene nanostructures. For starters, the Lipstein states that the total spin of a bipartite lattice is proportional to uh, the uh, lattice imbalance between the A and B sublattice. Here at the right side of the screen, I show an example of a triangular shaped uh, graphene nano island whose total spin grows with the size of the structure. This can also be extended to having local sublattice imbalance uh, in a structure. For instance, here I show a very known example, which is the six stack graphene nano ribbon where uh, the local sublattice imbalance that is present at the zigzag edges of this structure hosts uh, localized magnetic moments uh, at the edges of the, of the ribbon. Of course, the presence of atomic defects also generate um, localized states that um, give rise to localized magnetic moments. On the other hand, with the onset of um, bottom-up techniques like unsurface synthesis, uh, now all these scenarios that I just showed can be experimentally produced with a careful design and atomistic precision. In particular, really large systems can be now uh, synthesized. So we need a model that can handle with uh, such extended structures. For instance, the model that I will show uh, in this talk uh, allows us to run calculations locally in our machines and is Python based, which is really handy uh, in my opinion. Um, and can uh, obtain these self-consistent solutions uh, for large structures in a matter of seconds or minutes, depending on the size of the structure, and can give uh, results that are comparable to other more accurate uh, theoretical methods, such as density functional theory and so on, if one uses the correct tight binding parameterization, as Gaetano nicely explained yesterday in his talk. Okay, so... As I said, one way to study um, the um, magnetic features in graphene nanostructures is by employing the Hubbard model. This is the easiest way in which we can include electron column interactions in the model. Uh, this Hamiltonian is composed by two terms, the kinetical term, which is the pure tight binding Hamiltonian part that you are all familiar with. Uh, it just describes uh, the tunneling of electrons between neighboring atomic sites and is modulated by this hopping parameter and the interaction term, uh, which accounts for the um, uh, Coulomb repulsion that two electrons are going to feel when they try to occupy the same atomic site. The, uh, despite the apparent simplicity of this model, it cannot actually be analytically solved for most of the cases. So what we can do here is to approximate this product of operators, which is what is giving us the problem here to solve the Hamiltonian with uh, the following expression, where we have neglected um, uh, spin fluctuations. And with these ingredients, we now can solve the Hubbard Hamiltonian in the mean field approximation and find a self consistent solution by um, iteration method. Okay, so before I move on, I wanted to show the front page of our uh, GitHub repository, which you can find online uh, in GitHub. It's called the Hubbard package, uh, where you can always download the latest version here. And then you can always um, check the online documentation where we have a lot of information of all the classes and methods that we have implemented within uh, this package. Okay, now I will uh, continue to explain how uh, we can use the Hover package to 
find a self consistent solution for different systems uh, depending on their boundary conditions. And I will start with the case of isolated structures because it's the simplest one. So the iterative process begins by taking an input Hamiltonian and some input spin densities. Uh, then it diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. It builds new uh, output densities from, the, uh, from that uh, diagonalization. Uh, and it takes those uh, spin densities to update the Hamiltonian. Then two things can happen. Either the difference between the output and the input densities is smaller than the threshold, or the difference between the output and the in input densities is uh, larger than the threshold. In the first case, we will have found a self-consistent solution. In the other case, the self-consistent process has to start over uh, by setting the output densities as the in input densities and just uh, go again until it finds this, uh, this uh, step here. Um, here I show an example of uh, the spin polarizations that we obtained using the Howard package for a particular molecule that was experimentally synthesized by the group of uh, Nacho Pascual in Nanogune uh, in Donostia, San Sebastián. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here, but uh, I just wanted to show you uh, the comparison between our theoretical predictions or where of where the spin uh, spins localize in the molecule uh, compared to the experimental images. Um, I think uh, we all agree that <laughs> the, the resemblance is, is very good. The agreement is very good uh, between these two images. At the right side of the screen, I left uh, some uh, pseudo code lines to explain how one can actually use um, the Hover package to run such uh, calculation. Uh, this is all Python, okay. Um, okay, so basically we will start by defining the tight binding Hamiltonian of the structure for a specific geometry and set the dimension of the Hamiltonian to two because we want to spin polarize Hamiltonian using CISO, of course. Uh, then we will define the matrix element of the Hamiltonian and so on, as always. Um, then uh, we can build the Howard Hamiltonian by passing the tight binding Hamiltonian, the desired on site Coulomb repulsion, the temperature of the system, and uh, the total number of up and down spin components. Then, before convergence, we need to initialize the spin densities. Um, and we need this spin density distribution to uh, break the symmetry between up and down uh, spin components. Because if we start the convergence process with uh, some spin densities that, uh, some spin density distribution that is uh, equal for up and down spin components, then the code will not be able to find a symmetry broken solution, which is what we want. Um, so that's important. And furthermore, if we know or have an intuition of where the spins should localize in the molecule, we should use that, in, that intuition because it will probably save a lot of time um, uh, in the convergence process. So if the initial spin density is closer to the self-consistent solution, it would take uh, much less iterations to obtain such a uh, solution. So that's also handy. Another interesting um, feature of the Hover package is that we developed a plot class for the Minfield Hover Hamiltonian. So you can find in this class of the package a lot of different methods uh, to plot interesting physical quantities, such as the spin polarization, um, the charge distribution, the spin wave function, and so on. It, um, we have also developed a function um, in which we uh, can use the spin densities, the output spin density, so the final self-consistent solution of the mean field Hubbard, uh, as the input for a more accurate uh, spin polarized siesta calculation. Uh, so it, it can write the spin densities as an FDF block um, for a, a, a spin uh, polarized siesta calculation, which I think it can also save time in, uh, in that calculation. Okay, so here I show you also a comparison between our calculations with the mean field Hubbard and with other uh, more accurate um, density functional calculations, in particular in this case with, uh, with Siesta. Uh, and as you can see here, we can also find a very good agreement between, uh, between these two calculations. And I think uh, 
from these two slides, we can conclude that the mean behavior model is working perfectly nicely for, um, for these SP2 carbon systems. Uh, this type of exp, um, example of, of a molecule you can find in, a, in the tutorial one of the mean behavior uh, package. Okay, um, I will continue with explaining how we can find the uh, um, self-consistent solution for um, uh, for a system with periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so going back to our self-consistent uh, process, uh, generalizing the, the implementation for uh, systems with periodic boundary conditions is pretty easy because we only have to do the same as before, but for the block Hamiltonian. So now we would have to diagonalize the Hamiltonian uh, for each K point in the Brillouin zone and then integrate uh, to obtain the spin densities. But the rest of the process uh, is uh, exactly the same as before. Here I show an example of a calculation uh, of a one dimensional zigzag graph and nano ribbon, a periodic zigzag graph and nano ribbon, uh, which is a typical example because we know that this structure hosts a localized edge state uh, that tend to polarize um, when we include electron interactions in the residue. For instance, his, uh, that is the reason uh, of why. Um, the band structure of the polarized uh, structure um, opens a band gap uh, around the flat band area that uh, belongs to the band structure for the unpolarized case. This uh, band gap, which is called the correlation band gap, um, um, is proportional to the Coulomb repulsion parameter. At the right side of the screen, I also left some Co uh, line uh, code lines to explain how can we actually use the hover package to obtain such a calculation. So as before, um, we start with a Hamiltonian and we do the same as before, basically. The only thing that changes is that when we build the uh, hover Hamiltonian object, we have now to pass the number of key points uh, along each direction in which we want to sample the Hamiltonian during the convergence process. So say so we have a system that is periodic in two dimensions, then we should uh, set this number uh, or well, say this, the uh, system is periodic along the X and Y directions, then we will have to change this number and this number to a larger than one to sample the Hamiltonian along that uh, directions. And if the system is not periodic along say the C direction, then this number can remain uh, to one. And uh, uh, as something that I didn't tell before, sorry, I forgot. Um, when we go to the converge method here, that we iterate um, the Hamiltonian up to a certain tolerance, importantly, we have to pass a function that uh, will tell the code how the spin densities uh, are going to be obtained uh, during the convergence process. Um, for uh, molecules and periodic systems, this function uh, is the same because uh, this function is already generalized uh, for uh, accepting systems with periodic boundary conditions. Okay, I think I didn't forget anything here. Now I, I am going to do a small break um, and we come back after two or three minutes. Sophia, there's one question for you. Okay, I think we have to stop sharing to, no? You don't see uh, the no, question. I see. Yeah. Could you please clarify the difference between tight binding and Harvard models? I mean, the tight binding usually uh, doesn't account for Coulomb repulsion interactions. It's just um, it, you don't solve the type and Hamiltonian self consistently. Yeah. So uh, the second question is very interesting. I missed some part of the talk. How do you choose the Hubbard U value? This is very tricky. It's like choosing the parametrization for a type binding calculation. I mean, you have to know your system and compare with experiment. This is um. Uh, a semi-empirical value, and you have to choose a value. I mean, 
on one hand, it cannot be a, in a regime which is much, much larger than the hopping parameter, for instance. I think that's uh, something to take into account because otherwise you will uh, be in the strong correlated uh, regime. But the value of the U um, is not uh, really easy to give a straight answer here because it depends a lot on your system. And probably, for instance, if uh, the system is on a surface on, on another surface, uh, the interaction with the surface will screen uh, more or less uh, that value. So probably even in the same uh, geometry or molecule uh, will change if you compare to one ex uh, experiment or another. Uh, this is the same thing. Uh, well, the uh, question here is, what about the inter-site coupling? So this is the same thing. Um, as for the U value, you have to choose a parameter that describes your system, uh, knowing your system and comparing with other more accurate uh, descriptions such as density functional theory or um, other models um, that allow you to describe your system with that, that parameterization. But depends on the- um, The inter-site Coulomb repulsion, no? Well, the question is, what about the interstate coupling? Coulomb uh, coupling, the repulsion between different sites, that's that's not considered here. Ah, I understood. Okay, the coupling parameter. Yeah, that's not, well, we are actually working on that in the, there is a branch in the GitHub repository when we are working of, uh, with interstate um, Coulomb repulsion, but it's still not out. It's a, a working process. Another question here in your code, can we use, can we use more than one U parameter, the V parameter, that's a kind of hoping of how far from a parameter it's implemented. So, so far we have implemented uh, the implementation that is in the master branch and in the latest version um, allows only to pass uh, one value, a plot that is equal for all the atoms, but we are very close to uh, releasing a new, uh, uh, a new implementation where uh, you can pass uh, different U values depending on the um, on the different atoms are, that are present in the, in the structure, and also uh, different values that uh, your atoms with different orbitals may have. So yes, that is going to be soon uh, released. For your study of nanographing systems, how does the Haber model compare with DFT, say, bank structures? Uh, well, we have uh, performed comparisons for the zigzag graphene nanoribbons or anchor graphene nanoribbons and so on. And the comparison is pretty good. I mean, I would say uh, as good as a uh, tight binding calculation uh, would compare uh, with a DFT. So it probably, I mean, it for sure will depend on your tight binding parametrization. And I would say that the biggest change when adding a Coulomb repulsion uh, happens around the Fermi level. Uh, could one use as the input Hamiltonian, a DFT diagonal parameterized Hamiltonian, and then add to such HO with the hard time? Yeah, so this is what I was mentioning before, the new uh, changes that we are going to uh, really soon. Uh, will allow to pass a Hamiltonian for uh, with atoms with different orbitals where you can set the Coulomb repulsion for each orbital. So you should be able to pass your DFT um, Hamiltonian and add just the Hubbard term. Yeah. Uh, there is some comment I don't understand. Also called J parameter in some references. Uh, your Hubbard Hamiltonian in your code can work with Vanier 90 parameters. Um, I'm not familiar with Vanier 90. Um, I guess if you can extract the Hamiltonian, you could do the same as with uh, a Hamiltonian. Uh, I, I mean, and if you can extract it with CISO, which I'm not sure if you can. Uh, yeah, Nix is saying yes, so yes. <laughs> then you should be able to do the same as uh, the uh, question of Xavier asked. 
Okay, there is another question. If we increase the cutoff radius of an atom, see the file, much different from the pseudo-potential file, does, uh, does it take care of band gap estimation? Also, does it change the physical meaning of the atom? Um, sorry, I don't, I'm not familiar oh, a lot with uh, the pseudo-potentials and the, I maybe another one can, Answer this question. I think it's not very related to the power session. Okay, so should we have a short break? Okay, I will Two start minutes. in three minutes. Two, three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Okay, so uh, well, now I will continue with um, explaining how we can find a self-consistent solution uh, for systems with open boundary conditions. So, well, first of all, what is an open boundary? Uh, what is an open quantum system? So, uh, we already know this from previous talks uh, in this workshop, so I'm not going to go into uh, deep details here, but I want to introduce a little bit the concepts uh, in this context. So imagine that we want to obtain the mean field Haber Hamiltonian for an infinite system with a defect. Um, well, what people typically do is to apply bond uh, periodic boundary conditions uh, to the defect and uh, find a self-consistent solution for the block Hamiltonian um, with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, but that's not what we want here because we want the defect to appear only once in the structure. Uh, so what we can do is to use the dynamic equilibrium Green's function formalism to where we can uh, compute the Green's function of the device from which we can obtain the density matrix from which we can extract the spin densities uh, for this open quantum system. So let's start by defining the different parts uh, that take place in this calculation. So um, the, this structure can be divided in two parts. Uh, the, the electrons, so uh, the periodic part, which are periodic uh, bits uh, that grow towards some semi-infinite direction. And then uh, the device region or scattering area or central area or whatever you want to call it that contains the defect and uh, is coupled to uh, the semi-infinite bits. Then as uh, Nick already explained, you can couple the leads to the central region by using the soft energies of the leads. And then we can obtain the Green's function per speed channel of the device. Then uh, from the Green's function, I mean, we, we can use the Green's function uh, to obtain the spin densities for, uh, for this device. And use uh, that in each iteration uh, to obtain the self-consistent solution for this system. So going back again to our self-consistent process, uh, then we only have to substitute uh, the way in which we obtain the density, uh, the spin densities uh, in each iteration, which for this case, we will use uh, the Green's function, which we will iterate along an energy contour, which actually is extracted from a transistor calculation. Uh, and from this integration, we will uh, obtain the density matrix and from it, we can extract um, the, um, the spin densities in each iteration and the self-consistent process remains the same as before. So this new implementation is in a particular class of the Howard package, which is the NEGF class, which I will show uh, now, um, which contains this implementation with the Green's function formalism. Okay, so how uh, can we actually use the Howard package to obtain uh, the self-consistent solution for an open quantum system. So as uh, similarly in, as in the case of Transiesta, we first have to converse the mean field Haber Hamiltonians for the periodic electrodes. So we will define the, sub, uh, the unit cell of um, the electrodes and converse the mean field Haber Hamiltonian just as we saw before in the first part of the talk. And then we can continue with the different uh, steps for the uh, device calculation. So uh, as before, we start by defining the Hamiltonian, um, the type of Hamiltonian of the device for 
the device geometry. And don't forget to set the dimension of the problem to two because we want a spin polarized uh, Hamiltonian. And then we can um, define the Hubbard Hamiltonian object again by passing the um, tight binding Hamiltonian for the device, uh, the on site uh, Coulomb repulsion parameter, and the temperature of the system. And if we want to stay in the equilibrium regime, these two parameters should be the same as the one that we use in the convergence of uh, the electrodes. Then uh, we have to initialize the spin polarization as uh, before. And then we have to build the NEGF object for the device. So to do that, we just uh, have to pass the Hubbard Hamiltonian object for the device, a list of uh, containing tuples uh, with the already converged um, Hubbard Hamiltonian for each electron and each uh, uh, semi infinite direction. And this, this can be as long as uh, many electrons you have in your system. And then a list containing um, the atomic sites that correspond to where the electrodes are mapped in, in your device. And by building the NEGF object, uh, it allows us to uh, use the methods uh, with the Green's function formalism to, to obtain the spin densities um, uh, for the device. So we, when we call uh, the method converge here of the Hubbard uh, Hamiltonian class, we only have to pass um, the, um, uh, the function uh, from the NEGF class that tells the code that now the spin densities are going to be obtained uh, from the Green's function uh, of the device. Um, a nice and interesting usage uh, of our implementation for uh, to solve open quantum systems is the possibility to uh, study multi-terminal devices. A line of research that we have uh, been, develop, uh, been developing uh, these past years is the study of four terminal devices that are formed for, um, by two uh, graphic nanoribbons crossed with an intersecting angle of uh, 60 degrees. Uh, because the symmetry of uh, the honeycomb lattice um, at this uh, rotation angle, we, uh, there is a perfect matching uh, between the bottom and top sublattices. So uh, this translates in that uh, there is an enhancement of the transfer process um, of electrons between the two ribbons. And this also translates in that we can find really nice transport properties for uh, these four terminal devices. For instance, it has been shown that uh, if one injects electron, electrons into the device, uh, they will be equally split into two out of the four terminals without reflections. So in these conditions, the device will work as a perfect electron beam splitter. So now we can ask, what happens if we include electron interactions uh, in the recipe? So now with, with our implementation of the hardware package with uh, uh, to solve open boundary conditions, um, uh, we can obtain the spin densities for this four terminal device, as I show here, and obtain a spin uh, resolved uh, transport uh, properties of this device. For instance, here I show the spin resolved transmission probabilities that we obtain for this four terminal device. And we observe here, uh, well, first we compare here the case of the unpolarized case, which is this dashed dot line, and the case of the polarized case. Uh, which is the solid line. Uh, and you only see two curves uh, difference because the, uh, the transmission probabilities for both spin channels is the same, so the lines overlap. So we can observe uh, two things here. On, uh, on one side, that the beam splitting effect survives the presence of current repulsions. And on the other hand, the only things that uh, seems to be different from the unpolarized case when including electron interactions is that we now observe the band gap opening, the correlation gap uh, opening that corresponds to the band structure of the polarized zigzag graph and ribbon. So I think with this, I can conclude. Um, we have learned that the Haber model in the mean field approximation yields a very good description for this sp2 carbon system, as I showed the comparison between uh, our theoretical uh, results with this package and experiments and other more accurate 
uh, theoretical methods. And also uh, by, that by choosing the appropriate method in which we can obtain the spin densities, we can solve uh, a lot of many different systems, for instance, uh, molecules or periodic structures or systems with open boundary conditions. Please visit our uh, tutorials where you can play around with our uh, hover package in these uh, three different examples. Please note uh, Nick's comment in Discord uh, that you should uh, download the second version of uh, the tutorials. And lastly, I showed uh, uh, that now with our implementation uh, of the NEGF class, uh, by being able to obtain the spin densities for open quantum systems, we can also obtain their spin transfer properties, which is very interesting. And also, I would like to thank all the people that have participated in all the projects that I mentioned in this talk. In particular, thank you, Nick, for all your participation in the development of the Howard package. Uh, thank you all for your attention. <laughs>